Hey there, I'm T.G. Brandfault, and you are listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast. The Gondrepreneur.com podcast gives us an opportunity to speak directly with entrepreneurs and experts who are working on the front lines of the industry to normalize cannabis through responsible business, education, and activism. As your host, I will try to do my best to bring you actionable information to help you plan, grow, and manage your cannabis business. And today I'm joined by Jim McAlpine, founder of New West Summit, 420 Games, Power Plant Fitness, and Can Athlete. Hey, TG, how you doing? I'm doing great. So I'm doing all right. It's a bit cold here in Detroit, Michigan, but that's what you expect, right? It's December after all. It's pretty frosty across the whole United States right now. It's cold out here in Cali as well. Uh, well, let's uh, let's get right into it. I want to start a bit uh, about your personal journey. I, you know, read a lot of your interviews and uh, watched a bunch of panel discussions that you're on. And something that really struck me is that uh, used cannabis as a way as a way to uh, lose weight. And at first, that sounds a little count- counterintuitive to many because cannabis is known for its munchy side effect, and it's often used to help people regain their appetite or stop vomiting from chemotherapy. So how did you decide to take that route, and what was your approach and experience? Um, yeah, you know, about three years ago, uh, during when my wife had our second child, I kind of sat next to her and ate donuts and pizza and packed on a, a good solid 50 plus pounds. Um, so it does sound counterintuitive, but one thing people don't know, I think the majority of people don't know, is that edibles really kind of affect you differently than when you smoke. And edibles, if taken the right way, can can help suppress your appetite per se. So I used more of an edible dosing type of situation than smoking. And I think that's one of the reasons I was more successful um, because when you eat cannabis, it goes into your bloodstream and through your liver and it stays in your system a lot longer. So it affects you a little bit differently and works as an appetite suppressant better when you take cannabis as an edible. So you, you also paired that with an exercise regimen probably, right? Correct. Yeah. I was just going to go there. So, you know, the second piece of it is the majority of people that I meet don't find it fun to go out and and exercise. You know, I think most people look at that as a chore versus fun. And for me, what I did is kind of two things. I took down that barrier of like feeling like I needed to do what I did when I was in college. You know, I would find myself going to the gym and slapping all this weight on and feeling discouraged that I wasn't as strong as I used to be. So the first thing I did was I broke down that wall of like, you need to start slow. So take the cannabis out of it. Anyone trying to lose weight, like you can't just jump in and be what you used to be. So I said, hey, I'm going to start walking and just walk three miles every morning. And I rose that up to about five miles every morning. But I would smoke right before or eat right before, I should say. And uh, occasionally I would take a puff when I was out of edibles. But I, I would find that my cannabis kind of kicked in about the middle of my walk and it was right when I was getting a little bored and would want to turn around and the bird chirping started sounding a little cooler and the you know my mind started kind of flowing into a good state and I just found it helped me motivate myself to continue to exercise and stay out there and walk a little bit longer versus go back and and quit and do something else. So this wasn't something that was brought on by you know a encounter with a doctor or a nutritionist. It was just something that you discovered about yourself that you sort of uh, helped, you sort of used to help you develop this this motivation technique, essentially? Yeah, I had read here and there about the fact that edible cannabis works differently in terms of appetite suppression. But other than that, no, I just kind of dialed it in and like I said, when you're starting slow, it's not like I'm doing anything super uh, coordinate with coordination needed. So, you know, I just started with a little bit of ed- an edible and found my my sweet spot that way and, and then just slowly built upon what I did. So, yeah, it was kind of just a, a process of feeling it out myself for me. And I think that's important. Everybody's at a different level of needing to lose weight or athleticism. So just start slow and find your sweet spot is my suggestion to make it uh something you want to stick with. Because I, I, I hate that feeling of getting too high and eating too much. So um, both with the cannabis and the exercise, I think the, the key is starting slow so you stay engaged and you don't get those incredibly sore muscles and you want to do it again the next day. 
And so you kind of turn this into what is called the 420 games. And from the interviews that I've, I've read with you, 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 part of the reason that you created these events was to dispel the lazy stoner stereotypes. So can, can you tell us a bit more about kind of your thought process for the games, you know, what they entail? Yeah, absolutely. You know, starting with what you said, destigmatization, I, I kind of have always looked at Hollywood and the Jeff Spicoli and Dude Where's My Car images that are almost, you know, representative of a cannabis user. And that's that term stoner uh, as a blanket term for anyone that uses cannabis. And I personally dislike the term stoner. I think it insinuates laziness and stupidity. Um, so yeah, the, the goal out of the gate was to say, Hey, let's go out and do something really different than any other cannabis event. Cause I being completely frank, I, I don't think it's a bad event, but I think when the general public looks in at, at hemp con or the high times cups, it gives the industry and a cannabis user in general, so, a semi bad name. It kind of throws that stoner stigma out there. So I wanted to create an event that was the opposite of that. And we go out and do 4.20 mile runs uh, in different cities to show, hey, we're cannabis users, but we're not lazy. And we like to go out and do things, not sit on the couch and eat Taco Bell. Um, do, where, where are you holding these games? Where have you held them? Do you anticipate bringing them you know, to some of the newly legal states? Very much so, yeah. So our, this is just the end of our second year. Our first year, we were just in Northern California, but this past year, we did uh, a six-state tour, a six-city tour, I should say. We did uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles. We did Boulder and Denver, and we did Portland and Seattle. We're doing all of those cities again in 2017, but since uh, legalization swept across the nation, we decided to go to Boston and celebrate with them that they're now recreationally legal. We're going to go to Orlando, Florida. We're going to hit Phoenix, Arizona, and we're going to hit Las Vegas, Nevada and add those dates to the tour this year, too, to become a fully national tour. And what type of people do you see coming to these events? Is it, you know, high level athletes or is it, you know, somebody like me, for example, who, you know, could probably be in better shape, but could probably still run a 4.2 mile? Yeah, it's that's a great question, and it's a very big cross section of people. One of the guys that's uh, I don't want to call him sponsored, but he comes to all of our events. His name is Avery Collins. He's the world record holder in a two hundred mile race, and he's one of the top ten in the world at ultra marathons, which are hundred mile races. So he usually crushes everyone at the race, and there's several other you know very competitive runners that we see at all the races. Then there's guys like you and me that are kind of in that middle ground, just want to get back in shape or are trying to stay in shape, and. Honestly, my favorite people to see out there are both people that want to get back into shape because I think this whole thing is about inspiring people to come out and be active and you don't have to run. Just like I said, a lot of people come out and walk. So we have grandparents that come out. We have people that are very overweight that want to lose weight and it's a family friendly event. So we even have kids. My daughter, who's now seven, has walked uh, several of the events over the last couple of years. Was it difficult to find a place to uh, host these events? And, you know, what are the consumption rules that you have in place? The first answer is yes. And the stigma is the reason why. So when we first went to Golden Gate Park in San Francisco and wanted to do this, there was a, a massive kind of pushback from the park. And every new city we go to, we kind of get the same thing. Thankfully, now that we've done this for a couple years and we've got videos and a lot of media behind us, we can show them what we are now and they kind of get it more quickly. But it took a year for San Francisco and Golden Gate Park authorities to understand who we are. So we really just try and, and push softly and, and let them figure out that this is not your typical cannabis event. And, and to answer your second question, um, it kind of relates because... During these first two years here, we decided we were going to have no smoking at our events. So there's actually no smoking or vaping allowed at our events for a cognitive reason that we're trying to change the perception of cannabis. So we don't want people from the outside looking in to see a cloud of smoke figuratively and literally over our heads. Um, so we just we inspire people to say, hey, you can discreetly medicate prior to the event, or you can use an edible. But while you're here at our event, we want to have kids and families here. And we ask you all to uh, abstain from smoking in the general vicinity of our event. 
So you, I'm, I, I've seen some videos, and you guys have sponsorship booths, and obviously, uh, they're not similar to the booths that I saw at the Cannabis Cup uh, here in Michigan. I'm sure, um, but how do you go about selecting the sponsors? You know, do you, are they all cannabis businesses, or have some mainstream athletic brand, brands jumped on the bandwagon at all? Yeah, another good question. The majority are, you know, in each town or city, like the dispensaries and the brands, the edibles and the concentrates and the flower brands and different ancillary things like Ease is a delivery service that's out here in California at all of our events. But what really kind of made me feel like we'd hit something, uh, we hit a sweet spot and made something special is really the first non-endemic cannabis brands that I've ever seen come in to sponsor or associate with the cannabis industry have been our events. So I've had, you know, um, Bare Naked Granola came out to one of our events and sponsored it. Uh, Cliff Bar, one of the local TV stations, even Cron 4, one of the big local uh, San Francisco TV stations became a media sponsor. So I feel like we've created something special that's very different than anything out there. And it kind of gives the opportunity for the the non-cannabis companies to have a safe uh, venture to come sponsor or be part of what we do. And honestly, this year at um, MJ Biz, we had the honor of being awarded the industry's best consumer event. And I found it ironic that we're an event that doesn't even allow cannabis to be smoked at our event, and we won over all these other big cups and whatnot. So I think it says a lot about the way when we put these events on, we should be looking at how we position it. Um, you, I, I actually want to have consumption at these events eventually, but rather than have it be Dab Fest 2017, where people are taking 25 dabs and everyone looks like they're in a coma, I want to do microdosing and have our companies that are really, we pick them by only the highest level quality companies in cannabis. We're not going to go out and work with companies that don't focus on quality and you know healthy consumption. And I'd like to have those companies have the ability to more like sampling a fine wine and talking to a sommelier, take very small samples and really focus on the taste, not how high we can get in three hours at an event. <laughs> Uh, I, I do want to touch on this microdosing point, uh, but before we do, we have to take a short break. I am TG Brandfault, and you are listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast. Being an entrepreneur comes with a lot of stress. And while you are busy developing and running your business, managing a team of loyal employees, and working to build a sustainable venture, the last thing you should need to worry about are your personal finances. With Latitude Financial Group, you will have the tools you need to manage your finances efficiently and easily without all the hassle. Latitude Financial Group provides a platform that shows you everything you have all in one place and that stays current without time-consuming updates and synchronizations. You'll gain access to a free one-hour consultation and an award-winning financial management software suite that will empower you to better visualize and manage your finances. With Latitude, you can form a relationship with an unbiased, fee-based, objective, professional, personal advisor who understands your unique concerns, who listens to your needs, and who has years of experience applying financial solutions to the most complicated of financial scenarios. Based in Denver, Colorado, the Latitude Financial Group team will work with you in ways that fit your life. Whether you prefer a face-to-face -face meeting with an advisor at one of their 20 Metro Denver area locations, a phone call, or a Skype meeting, they can help you work to achieve your financial goals. So, if your personal or business finances are causing you stress, if you are losing sleep wondering if your financial future is secure in the career path you have chosen, or if you want to work with a financial advisor who is interested in helping you become successful in your business endeavors, give Latitude Financial Group a call and start being proactive about your financial future today. Don't wait. Latitude is offering the first 10 listeners one year of free access to their award-winning software platform. Go to rollingingrass.com. That's rollingingrass.com to get Latitude in your financial life. Securities offered through Securities America Incorporated, a registered broker-dealer member of FINRA and SIPC. Advisory services offered through Securities America Advisors Incorporated, an SEC-registered investment advisory firm. Scott Cody, Daniel Grote Representatives, Latitude Financial Group, and Securities America are unaffiliated. Latitude Financial Group and the Securities America companies are unaffiliated. All right. 
Welcome back. You are listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast. I am TG Brandfault here with Jim McAlpine, the founder of New West Summit, the 420 Games, Power Plant Fitness, and Can Athlete. Uh, before the break, you had uh, mentioned microdosing, and in virtually every uh, panel I watched you uh, speak on and every article that, that you're quoted in, uh, you're a proponent of this idea of micro microdosing. Um, what is your theory behind microdosing? Well, so speaking from an athletic standpoint, what I like to do when I use cannabis is increase my focus, like take my consciousness and ramp it up just a small amount so I become a little more engaged in what I'm doing. I don't want to become totally spun where I'm super, super high and my coordination or my thought process is going to be impaired. So the best way for people to do that is ingest smaller amounts of cannabis um, and now that it's legal, we can look at the labels and what we're putting in our body. And for, in my perception, a microdose is about five milligrams of cannabis or less. Some people say 10 milligrams or less, but I, I would say about five milligrams or less per dosage is what I quantify as a microdose. Um, and actually to expand a little bit, um, you know, you mentioned Can Athlete, one of our companies um, that is the world's first athletic cannabis brand. What we did is we actually drilled it down even further. I don't think in, in the marketplace I've seen anything under five except one company, Kiva, makes a 2.5 milligram microdose. Our spray that we make is one milligram per uh, spray per spray in your mouth. And what I really think that's going to be helpful for, or if you've not used cannabis before, or you haven't tried it in 20 years and you're going to do it again now because it's legal, you know, you want to start, you want to start slow. And uh, as I talked about earlier, it's not a good feeling when you get too high. And I think your first experience is a very important one. And I really, really don't want people in their first experience to eat five or 10 milligrams and get that, oh shit, I'm not feeling, you know, great feeling. I'm too high. Um, so yeah, I think microdosing is both a great way for people to introduce themselves to edible cannabis use because it's hard to figure out what your dose is. And then as an athlete, I think it allows you to increase your focus without incre uh, decreasing your coordination. I mean, to your point, I think that a lot of uh, people who do use cannabis on a daily basis do this without recognizing that that's what they're doing. Uh, just quickly and aside, uh, most of the time before I go and cover a story, I'll eat a five milligram gummy uh, because it helps cure my anxiety essentially. Um, and, you know, I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. Um, you know, so the, the mainstreaming, I guess, of microdosing through, uh, you know, the 420 games or through, through your own activism is uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very interesting uh kind of point that I, that I'm not seeing that much of. Um, so I, I do too want to talk about, uh, using cannabis to help with recovery. Uh, you know, which, which is that something that, that microdosing is also useful for? Yeah. You know, when someone says to me just straight up, Hey Jim, what is marijuana and sports? What's it good for? How do you do it? You know, to my answer is there's two ways, you know, there's focus. You can use it prior to your athletic activities to help accentuate focus. And then the other answer is recovery, just like you just said. Um, and that one, you know, goes outside of the THC to the CBD part of the plant as well, which I think both are effective in helping that pre-workout recovery um, aspect uh, that an athlete needs. So is it also good for recovery from, say, a long-term sports-related injury? Um, and is, would there be any differences in approach to using it for, say, a long-term injury versus maybe a short-term injury? Yeah, you know, I think a good example I'll use there. So my daughter's uh, great-grandmother, my wife's grandmother, she's in her 90s. She's in a uh, uh, assisted living home. And, you know, she's had really bad pain for years and years and years on her knees. And... Finally, I brought her some topical cannabis to put on her knees and, you know, she called us as we were driving home crying saying, oh my God, please bring more of that. It's the first time I've been out of pain in so, so long. So I think when you're, you know, in, in a state of chronic pain, whether you're an athlete or an elderly person or you've just hurt yourself, 
I think that finding topicals and things that you rub on top that goes into your body through your bloodstream or through your skin is a really great way for more those more long-term injuries to let cannabis soak in and, and kind of help with the, the long-term pain that you, ex the chronic pain that you experience. And then on the short term for athletes that hurt themselves or are just, you know, I just finished a long run and I, I just kind of want to get back into that place where I'm not feeling so cramped and whatnot. I think both CBD and THC can help an athlete at the end of a workout just kind of get back into that comfort place um, and recover a little bit quicker than if they just, you know, didn't use anything at all. Um, so I think it's good on both sides of the fence. And I think the real important thing that the world realizes is you don't have to get high using cannabis for recovery. You can use just the part of the plant called CBD and topical gels or even ingest it through smoking and you're not going to feel any psychoactive effects. It's just going to help with joint pain and, and all the other things your body might be craving to recover. Do people at the 420 games, do you see people using uh, cannabis products during the cool down period after, uh, you know, the run, for example? You know, um, I, like I said, we're not, we don't allow smoking there. So yeah, uh, I don't see a lot of people using at the event, but I actually talked to everybody at the event about like, you know, Hey, how do you use cannabis and how does it help you as an athlete? And I think honestly, I use it for focus and I use it on long distance swims and, and whenever I'm going to go out and do something because I have some ADD, um, and it helps me stay focused. But I really believe the majority of people use cannabis for recovery more so than for focus. And most of the people I talk to say, yeah, they either, you know, they're going to go home and whether it's smoke a little bit to recover or, or eat an edible or use a topical, I've, almost all of the people at the games on some level use it post-event workout uh, to recover. So uh, when we were talking about microdosing, you had mentioned the, uh, the, the can athlete. Um, a part of that is the Train Like a Champion series. I'd seen uh, the website and I'd seen some videos. Um, how'd you develop that program and how'd you find athletes such as uh, Jake Shields to participate in that series? So that is my partner. He's, his name is Sabo Shen. He's in the industry. He actually makes the most healthy delivery device called the Vape Exhale. And so my partner Sabo knows Jake and he got, he got him involved. And we've also got another UFC guy that we're both friends with, Denny Prokopos. Uh, he's a, a national champion that came out of Greece. Um, but really the jujitsu community is probably the most cannabis friendly and the highest percentage of the jujitsu community as, as of any sport, um, are, are cannabis users. It was a surprise to me cause I really didn't know that, but jujitsu and cannabis are almost as symbiotic as yoga and skiing and snowboarding. Um, it just seems to be something that all the jujitsu athletes are drawn to. Um, so we were lucky enough to have those guys come out and teach us weekend warriors some rolling techniques and some stretching techniques. And personally, they, they taught me a, a kettlebell workout that I did for 20 minutes and I was sore for three days. So um, it's really taking some, some high level professional athletes that use cannabis and letting them show us weekend warriors how they integrate it into their training and kind of just giving us that extra nuance as the non-professionals to uh, step it up a notch, if you will. We're going to get a little bit more uh, to athletes uh, about you know, kind of the mainstream uh, narrative that's going on right now, but we got to take one more short break. I'm TG Brandfault. You are listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast. At Gondrepreneur, we have heard from dozens of cannabis business owners who have encountered the issue of canna bias, which is when a mainstream business, whether a landlord, bank, or some other provider of vital business services, refuses to do business with them simply because of their association with cannabis. We have even heard stories of businesses being unable to provide health and life insurance for their employees because the insurance providers were too afraid to work with them. We believe that this fear is totally unreasonable and that cannabis business owners deserve access to the same services and resources that other businesses are afforded, that they should be able to hire consultation to help them follow the letter of the law in their business endeavors, and that they should be able to provide employee benefits without needing to compromise on the quality of coverage they can offer. This is why we created the Gondrepreneur.com Business Service Directory, 
a resource for cannabis professionals to find and connect with service providers who are cannabis friendly and who are actively seeking cannabis industry clients. If you are considering hiring a business consultant, lawyer, accountant, web designer, or any other ancillary service for your business, go to gondrepreneur.com businesses to browse hundreds of agencies, firms, and organizations who support cannabis legalization and who want to help you grow your business. With so many options to choose from in each service category, you will be able to browse company profiles and do research on multiple companies in advance so you can find the provider who is the best fit for your particular need. Our business service directory is intended to be a useful and well-maintained resource, which is why we individually vet each listing that is submitted. If you are a business service provider who wants to work with cannabis clients, you may be a good fit for our service directory. Go to gondrepreneur.com businesses to create your profile and start connecting with cannabis entrepreneurs today. Welcome back to the gondrepreneur.com podcast. I'm your host, TG Brandfall, here with 420 Games founder, Jim McAlpine. Um, before the break, we were talking about the Train Like a Championship series and uh, how you had gotten some high-level uh, athletes to participate in that. Um, in interviews, you've said, you know, marijuana use, and you've said in this interview, marijuana use does not equal stoner. Uh, do you think that admissions by legendary NBA coach Phil Jackson and championship winning NBA coach Steve Kerr, both, are, both who are extremely respected in their sport, you know, Phil Jackson might be the best coach of all time. Do you think that their admissions that they use medical cannabis will help change the narrative at all in professional sports? Bill pissed off LeBron a couple weeks ago, but I still have a lot of respect for him. Um, no, I was ecstatic to see that. When I saw Coach Kerr come out recently, being I'm a California guy and a Warriors fan, that was amazing. And I think it's absolutely, especially, you know, now that it's being, it's coaches, not players and respected coaches at that, that's a huge uh, leap forward. And, you know, about maybe three or four weeks ago, I got a call from a guy named Rick Barry, who's probably in the top 50 all-time NBA players. Um, he and I went and had lunch, and he doesn't use cannabis. He, he's never used cannabis, but he wanted to come talk to me about power plants and how he could get involved because although he's never used it, he agrees that the league should bring it into prominence and allow people to use it. And he also, as a businessman, sees the potential. So, yeah, you know, from guys like Rick, who are advocates of the use of it, but don't use marijuana, and then coaches like Coach Kerr and, and Jackson, like, those are incredibly forward-moving things for, for our industry to have those guys, quote-unquote, coming out of the closet, if you will. And you interact with a lot of high high level professional athletes. Uh, Ricky Williams is your partner, correct on the, the power plant uh, gym. Yeah. Ricky helped me launch the gym, and I also I work with a lot of other football players. Like one of my good friends is Eugene Monroe. We just went and did a, a little podcast yesterday. Um, yeah, in San Francisco, and Eugene's an amazing guy who just retired and is fighting the NFL. Like directly head on to change their policies. Um, yeah, and I got a long list of what I've really wanted to do is build a list of different athletes from different sports because the NFL is getting a lot of focus right now. But, you know, I want I've got a an NHL player named Riley Cote and uh, a couple UFC fighters and Major League Baseball players. So it goes beyond football and basketball in into all sports, you know. I'm, I'm hopeful that we get an Olympic badminton player to, to be on our team because literally from weekend warrior up through those professional top level guys, there's benefit to all of them. So, um, yeah, the, the pro athletes, though, they get the eyeballs and those are the guys that really get people to listen to us. So I'm blessed and very thankful of all those guys that are helping me further the cause. Have any of them been able to give you a sense of what it might take for cannabis therapies to be accepted by the professional leagues? You know, it's, it's a frustrating uh, road. So I'm going to go backwards just quickly a little bit, like using the NFL as the, as the conduit and then going into other things. But, you know, the NFL, I watched a movie called Concussion with Will Smith re recently, and everybody should watch that because it tells the story of what CT is and what it does so well. And what I learned in that movie is 
there's like hundreds of NFL players that put a gun in their mouth and blew their heads off. You know, Rashawn Salam just killed himself a week or two ago. He was a friend of mine as well and Heisman Trophy winner. And most people are suspecting that was CTE related. So um, just uh, getting to this point where everybody's stepping out of the darkness. Like Eugene actually stepped out against, you know, the owners association, which are a bunch of white privileged billionaires that are very, very conservative. So to me, the two things that need to happen are more guys like Eugene need to step out and say, no, this is, this is messed up and we're not going to stand for it. And we demand change from you guys. And that's happening right now. Many, many guys are following behind him. And secondarily, the blessing that we have with legalization is science because, you know, people like the NFL can come back and say like, well, everybody says this, but show us hard science to imperial evidence and it's hard to do that right now because we don't have any so now that we're able to compile data that's all pointing to the facts that were correct we can actually point towards doctors and uh, and clinical data that says look you can't refute this this stuff works and you need to let your players use it so let's let's say that medical cannabis were to be approved by athletic commissions the question would have to be asked is cannabis or could it be considered a performance enhancing drugs? You know, what do we know scientifically about how cannabis interacts with human physiology during exercise? I mean, I don't mean to say that I have the answer in a hundred percent, but I will strongly say that I very, very firmly believe cannabis is not technically a performance enhancing drug. And, and definitions important there because a lot of people, when they say performance enhancing, they just feel like, oh, you're having a better time or whatever. But performance enhancing drug to me technically means something like a steroid that gives you an unfair advantage to build more muscle than the guy next to you. And the best analogy I can use is the, the drug caffeine. Like any athlete can go drink a Red Bull to get more energy before they go out on the field. I hate caffeine. I don't drink caffeine, so I, don't, I choose not to use it, but another player can. So I don't see why cannabis is, is, would not be looked at the same way. It's a substance that doesn't give you an unfair advantage. If you like caffeine and it gives you a little pump up, great. If you like cannabis, it helps you focus, great. That's the way I look at it. And I don't think it should be something that – I, I wouldn't recommend an NFL player smoke weed right before they go on the field and go into the on the on the gridiron, the battlefield. But um, if they really wanted to, I don't think there should be a law that says they can't do that. Do do we know much about how cannabis interacts with us while we exercise, or is that you know the jury's still out, the the research is still being conducted, sort of thing? You know, I think I. Erring on the side of being cautious, I think I can't say anything with 100% certainty, but there is a lot being done. And uh, I guess I'm just waiting for the, the empirical evidence to pile up so we can really begin to point at it. But there is like, I'll use one example. Very recently, um, you can Google this. There, there's been a lot of studies that have been done that the runner's high, quote unquote, that many people say comes from endorphins actually comes partially or almost mostly from the endocannabinoid system. So through research that scientists have done on how people enter that state through exercise, at, uh, again, the runner's high, it's been, it's been, I can't say that endorphins aren't responsible for part of it, but it's been fairly strongly proven that the majority of that feeling comes from the endocannabinoid system. And that in and of itself kind of makes a huge statement that cannabis and athletics go together pretty well. So as, as, as someone who is involved with numerous fronts in the industry, uh, what would you say is the most important thing that an inspiring cannabis entrepreneur should keep in mind as they go about launching their business? Oh, man, I would say, you know, everybody in this industry right now, you have to have some uh, some staying power and you have to have persistence and I would, the thing I would advise most entrepreneurs coming into this industry is to just do it. You know, don't sit there and overthink it. Like, this is a good industry. It's a growing industry. It's not too late, but you have to have a strong, strong desire to, um, to forge down the path when people are telling you you shouldn't be forging down that path. So I think it's just a strong sense of understanding that this is an amazing plant that does really, really good things. And if in your heart you know that, I think you just need to stay true to what you know and, and don't listen to those people that are telling you you're doing the wrong thing. There's, there's so many doubters and so many haters out there. For me, it was 
it was hard to get over that hurdle to have my name associated with cannabis, but I'm so incredibly glad I did. And for anybody that's thinking about it, I was worried about being judged by the PTA where my kids go to school or my people that I work with. And I've literally had no one tell me that they think I'm doing a bad job or it's something that's, that's inappropriate. So I was very surprised at the pats on the back I got for jumping into this industry. And it's been an ex incredible experience. And I, I hope many more other people make the jump as well. Well, Jim, we're just about out of time, but I want to thank you so much for joining us. And maybe we'll see the 420 games in newly legal states like Michigan and, and, uh, pretty soon. I would love that, by the way. So anyone out there in Michigan that hears this, shoot me an email. It's just jim at 420games.org. And we're expanding, and we want to come to Michigan and many, many, many other places. So if you live somewhere and you want to see us come there, shoot me an email. I'd love to hear from you. You can find more episodes of the Gondrepreneur.com podcast in the podcast section of Gondrepreneur.com and in the Apple iTunes store. On the Gondrepreneur.com website, you will find the latest cannabis news and cannabis jobs updated daily along with transcripts of this podcast. Uh, you can also download the Gondrepreneur.com app in iTunes and Google Play. I've been your host, T.G. Brandfall.